Hi everyone, hey, welcome. Welcome to my channel and welcome to my Monday video, which is dedicated to whatever the Eclectic Book Club is reading. The Eclectic Book Club is a book club that I am running with David Wiley um, here on, on BookTube. We have a very active Voxer group. You're welcome to join. Voxer is a free app that allows us to chit chat back and forth about the Odyssey. Should show the book, right? <laughs> So we chat about the Odyssey with the rest of the Eclectic Book Club in our Voxer group, and it's it's a whole a whole heck of a lot of fun. Um, and what David and I, what we try and do is that we chat about the Odyssey about once a week and um, volley questions back and forth to one another so that we can think about the answers and try and answer them in our following video. So, um, David talked about the concept in the Odyssey that we see over and over again and it's this very like human cycle of seeing what's best, knowing in our hearts and minds what's best for us and then making a decision that's completely opposite to that. Um, yeah. Oh, one moment. David, I really love that you picked up on the humanity in the Odyssey. Um, I have noticed that same cycle that you talked about, the moment of decision making, the moment where we know, <laughs> like as, you know, both as readers in the Odyssey, like what would be the better decision to make for Odysseus and his crew members. Um, and then we watch these characters make decisions that aren't in their best interest. And it's so relatable. It's so relatable. As, um, as for me, sitting here, there are so many things that I know that um, would be better for me, like exercise. I exercise some, I don't exercise a ton, and I know that it would be great for me if I did, and yet I still make the decision not to. Um, and then also like, you know, I personally drink coffee and I know that that's not the best thing for me. Um, but even bigger, even, even broad, more broadly, we watch these heroes, these um, Greek gods and, and men make mistakes and um, pay, pay for those mistakes with treacherous consequences. And that is really, really, really interesting um, in, in the Odyssey. And I think as a whole, you, we see a lot more humanity in, in the Odyssey throughout the whole book. Whereas I feel that we saw the humanity in the Iliad mostly near the end, especially as we're mourning, as, as the Ache Achaeans and Trojans are mourning their, their soldiers. But in the Odyssey, we see it all throughout. It could be because of the episodic nature of the Odyssey versus the Iliad, um, or the fact that we're really following one really truly strong main character of Odysseus throughout, and we're watching his character development. I mean, this is a character, more of a character-driven novel than the Iliad is. Playing on David's theme of humanity, we get to this book, Hospitality in the Forest, um, book 14. So, spoilers ahead, in book 13, um, Odysseus finally gets to Ithaca, and I believe it's uh, the gray-eyed Athena who cloaks Odysseus in basically a disguise. A disguise as an old, unkempt, sort of scraggly old man, and, um, and Odysseus is really kind of, his whole form is changed, and so nobody can recognize him. And what Odysseus does is he goes into the forest and he's kind of trying to spy in a way. He's trying to figure out where his name is now um, and where things are at. Get the lay of the land before he reveals himself as, you know, ruler and um, king and so on and so forth. And so Odysseus is in the forest and he um, runs into Eumaeus, I believe it's called, who is almost a shepherd of sort, a forester is what they call him in, in my version. And Eumaeus has this wonderful hospitality to a stranger. Um, he doesn't know who Odysseus is. Odysseus doesn't reveal him his true self to Eumaeus. Um, but instead, what he what Eumaeus does is that he invites this old man in who he doesn't know and feeds him and they exchange stories and Eumaeus talks about his love for Odysseus and his desire to have his, you know, ruler back in place. And, um, and, and it's a really wonderful moment in the book because it feels so, like, so human. <laughs> um, uh, that, that, you know, maybe that's a cop-out to say it feels so human. 
it feels like something that my family would do. Um, we, I mean, like we've had people over that we barely know for lunches and dinners through um, church activities or as part of a fellowship uh, effort to bring the church together. Um, and, and it was one of those things where like everybody was welcome and a lot of times you met people that you wouldn't have met before. Um, you chat with folks that, or at least I chatted with folks or sat with people that I didn't know and you find out about their lives and um, and it's really fascinating. And that little spark of humanity is something that um, I think was quite lacking or that didn't come out as much in the Iliad. This um, like... I mean, even Odysseus calls the, sh the forester um, compassionate and kind. Um, and I don't know if those words showed up in the Iliad. And so here we go. I'm going to actually um, read you a small passage from uh, book 14. I'm just going to read a small quote, which is going to start with a forester chatting to Odysseus. And then um, it's going to say the forester led him to his hut, led him as an Odysseus in disguise. So it says, to the cabin, you're a wanderer too. You must eat something, drink some wine, and tell me where you're from and the hard times you've seen. The forester has stopped talking, and so it says, The forester now led him to his hut, made a couch for him with tips of fur, piled for a mattress under the wild goatskin, shaggy and thick, his own bed covering. Odysseus, in pleasure at this courtesy, gently said, quote, May Zeus and all the gods give you your heart's desire for taking me in so kindly, friend. End quote. Eumaeus says this, Oh, my swine herd answered him. Tush, friend, rudeness to a stranger is not decency. Poor though he may be, poorer than you, all wanderers and beggars come from Zeus. What we can give is slight but well meant. All we dare. Um, and I just think that it was almost like, you know, Odysseus is like, wow, thank you for taking me in a stranger. And this, this forester was like, no, this is the least that we can do for, for you. Not knowing who he is, not knowing his place or what his true identity is. It is really just the goodness of someone's heart. And this is something that I feel like we don't really get to see in the Iliad as much because it's all about war and honor and killing and winning and, and I mean it's about so so much but it's not about the small moments of humanity that I often tend to seek in my reading every day. So in, in that way uh, I see a lot of humanity uh, David in, in, in the Odyssey um, a lot more in the, than in the Iliad and in that way it's a lot more approachable and friendly to, to read. So as David was reminding me about <laughs> humanity and um, just a reminder of like the faults of being human and, and not always making the decisions that are the best for us. Um, and, and in thinking that, I was thinking about other literature and connecting actually the Iliad and the Odyssey with literature that I know, um, fair, you know, fairly well, well, well enough, I've read it. Um, but I actually was making connections. Okay, so that's what really this, you know, section is about, is about making connections. Um, and so as we are sitting with this sort of hospitality in the forest, as the chapter says, um, and we are with Eumaeus, I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong, but Eumaeus is, uh, this forester, is a really interesting character. He seems uh, really good hearted um, for really no apparent reason, just sharing their wealth, sharing uh, his own food, and then also having this undying loyalty to Odysseus and just letting this stranger know who is Odysseus, but letting the stranger know um, how things would be so much better if their, if their ruler was back and um, really longing to have Odysseus back. And the, the forester has a simplicity, a, a likable simplicity to him. And I was thinking about this idea of likable simplicity. <laughs> and, and I was really able to connect it to The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. And, um, and in the same way as, uh, as the Odyssey is very episodic. Well, actually, let me go back to the, you know, uh, joyful simplicity of humanity. I feel like the hobbits are that. The hobbits love their food, they love their company, they love the comfort of their home, and they are, at least Bobo is, like, rather open to adventure. I think actual hobbits are sort of, you know, they, they like this, oh no, they, li <laughs> they like the safety of, um, of their homes, and they don't really want to 
uh, reach out and, and you know, join in in the adventures. But Bilbo, he's got a little bit of a mysterious or an adventuresome streak. And so Bilbo ends up going on a really grand adventure. And the, there is, though, this really beautiful simplicity with the hobbits and what they take pleasure and joy in. They are like the ultimate comfort creature. <laughs> I mean, they're so fantastic. Um, and in that, with that simplicity, I really thought about the forester in the Odyssey, um, who is just welcoming and, and um, willing to spend, share oh, their, both their time and their resources with a stranger, just out of the compassion of their own heart, which, um, Homer says, and, and I don't really think that we see this type of humanity until now in the Odyssey, this type of generosity, um, charity, goodness, that really comes out in the Odyssey and is really missed in, in the Iliad. Another thing that I noticed with the Odyssey and The Hobbit is that the Odyssey is incredibly episodic. Um, almost every book stands on its own as having its own character um, story arc and character arc, and it seems to have it very. It seems to be very complete, and and The Hobbit is like that as well. When I read this after I read The Lord of the Rings, I was really surprised at how. I don't want to say simple, but like how episodic it was. It's like there are very clear things that happen and there aren't any um, interwoven storylines to muck up what's really going on. You're following a very streamlined story. Um, and and so Bilbo's, Bilbo's story really reminds me of the, the setup, the structure really reminds me of, of the Odyssey. Now, continuing with the Lord of the Rings, what's so funny is that the, the actual Lord of the Rings reminds me a lot more of the, of the Iliad. The Iliad has, spends a long time setting up uh, the exposition, like what's going on and what's been going on with the Trojans and Achaeans and what this war means and who the players are. And then there's these epic battle scenes, right? And in a lot of ways, um, Lord of the Rings is, is a lot more complex than that. Um, Tolkien tackles a lot with the Lord of the Rings and he definitely has a huge story arc with a lot of very well-developed characters. Um, but in the same way, you get that kind of building, um, the building up of, a, of a, an, an epic battle coming soon or coming eventually, um, and you get the, the tension is rising and, and the, um, you know, life and death and, and this really, it's just really epic adventure, right? And so in a lot of ways, I really think that the Iliad and the Lord of the Rings are, are kind of like a pairing, like if somebody was to read the Iliad, I would be like, oh, I think you would really like the Lord of the Rings. Ooh, one moment. Whereas if somebody was like, I really love, I really, really love the Odyssey. What should I read next? Um, or what is something like it that you can recommend? Or what are some authors who have been inspired by the Odyssey? I would say most definitely without a doubt, the Hobbit. The Hobbit, I think, is Tolkien's homage to the Odyssey. Among other things, Tolkien was a huge fan of ancient and old literature. I mean, he taught Beowulf as a professor or as, I know he translated Beowulf and I believe he taught it. You know what? Don't, don't fact, fact check, check me on that. But anyways, so I, I just wanted to say that the pair, like, we would not have Tolkien without Homer. We would not have Tolkien without Homer. And some of Tolkien's inspirations are just so, so clear. Um, just so clear from The Hobbit to The Odyssey, from The Lord of the Rings to The Iliad. Things got a little bit crazy <laughs> in my household. And so as I was asking my question, I was thinking, um, you know, what connections have you all made with other literature and, and connecting that to the Odyssey? What have you seen that has drawn inspiration from the Iliad or the Odyssey from Homer's uh, writings? I, I'm really curious. Um, again, the, the connection that I made the strongest was between Homer and Tolkien. And I'm curious as to what you all say. All right, that's it, huh? See, that's it from us. That's it Say so thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dad. That's so soon. <laughs> all right, so thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> I will see you all in my next one. Bye, guys.